I want to acknowledge that we're hosting this session um, or broadcasting this session, shall I, shall I say, from the unceded ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh Nations, and the Métis Char community of the Lower Mainland region. And all of you throughout the province and the rest of uh, this uh, country um, are um, acknowledging elders past, present, uh, and future, and the land that we're on. And uh, now that we have our atmospheric river back uh, and the rain is pummeling down in Vancouver, I think that we're uh, grateful um, to nature and for all that uh, that she brings us. So a moment to reflect on where you are. Uh, Province-wide rounds, as you know, is a collaboration between UBC Division of Nephrology and BC Renal, uh, proudly supported uh, and generously contributed to by a number of our industry partners listed there and all of you that make this possible in the various health authorities around the province. And with that, I'd like very much uh, truly a privilege to be able to uh, present one of uh, Canada's uh, most um, well-known and uh, appropriately so uh, clinician scientist, Dr. David Cherney. Uh, Dr. Cherney uh, did his human renal physiology training at the Institute of Medical Science at U of T in 2008. He's currently a professor at, in the Department of Medicine at U of T and a clinician scientist at UHN and Mount Sinai Hospitals. He's the director of the Renal Physiology Lab and supported by a number of grants, most recently the CIHR, Kidney Foundation, JDRF, and the Heart and Stroke uh, Richard Luer Center of Excellence, as well as the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. And he's a recipient of a five-year combined CIHR KFOC team grant in diabetes complications, which runs to 2027. He's supported by the Department of Medicine at U of T uh, by a Merit Award, and his research program focuses on physiological factors that initiate kidney disease in patients with diabetes, especially looking at renal hyperfiltration inflammation and its role in the heart-kidney access in diabetes. Uh, very proudly, as Canadians, we can uh, uh, acknowledge that he, in 2019, he received the ASN Distinguished Researcher Award for Outstanding Contributions to Nephrology for all his work in SGLT2 world, and also the Diabetes Canada CIHR Institute um, of uh, Nutrition, Diabetes, Metabolism, Young Scientist Award. So we're really grateful and uh, pleased to be able to welcome him virtually to BC to talk about evolving therapies. So over to you, David, and uh, looking forward to hearing about evolving therapies and how we can help manage our patients uh, better with, with these novel therapies. Great, thanks very much, Adira. So, uh, let me share again, and just want to make sure that everyone can see my slides and hear me okay. Yes, yes perfect, perfect. Great, okay, thank you. So we're going to talk about advances in the management of chronic kidney disease, and thank you very much for the, for the kind introduction, Adira, uh, and we'll talk about evolving treatments for kidney disease and talk about uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and, uh, and beyond. Um, in terms of um, in terms of my disclosures, you can see them on this slide, and I've worked with many of the different uh, uh, companies in this field um, that have been looking at cardiorenal and metabolic uh, factors that are that are contributors to CKD progression. So, by way of background, uh, we'll talk um, about uh, and objectives. We'll talk about a little bit of background, but mainly focus on these. Uh, on these three areas, SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, mechanisms of kidney protection, some key clinical trial data, uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism, especially with finerenone uh, and diabetic kidney disease. And then we'll talk about GLP-1 receptor agonists and dual agonists because there's lots of interest in that field as well. So rather than just focusing on one area, we'll focus on, on these, three, um, these three fields to get a sense of what's, uh, what it currently exists and what may be uh, coming in the future. So uh, by way of, uh, of background, many of you will be familiar with this, with this concept that essentially until recently, we had very little uh, new to talk about in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in terms of renal protection in people with diabetes. We were really focusing on glycemic control, blood pressure control, RAS inhibition, and control of various cardiovascular risk factors, uh, including uh, use of statin therapies. And uh, soon we'll uh, look at the most recent recommendations and see how much this has really changed 
uh, in terms of the, uh, the the different levels of protection and the uh, the breadth of patients who are included in these recommendations. So this has really changed, especially over the last uh, three to four years since the SGLT2 trials and some of the other work in the MRA field have uh, has been completed and published. And so in thinking about the various um, factors that contribute to uh, renal disease progression and the therapies that target those areas for, uh, for reducing the risk of CKD progression, this is a summary of some of the major factors that are associated with renal disease progression. And these include um, uh, hemodynamic abnormalities that we can target with therapies such as ACE inhibitors and angiotensin blockers, SGLT2 inhibitors, and even endothelin blockers that many of you will be familiar with from the SONAR trial that was published in the same meeting when Credence was published uh, and presented. Uh, these therapies all likely exert their renal protective effects through reducing intraglomerular pressure, and in doing so, reducing albuminuria and reducing CKD risk, risk over time, and I'll show you some of that data soon. We also know that, that these, uh, that, that, uh, that CKD progression is, uh, is related to, of course, inflammation and fibrosis, uh, shown in the red circle at the top, um, and uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, RAS inhibitors, uh, as well as mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and GLP-1 receptor agonists are thought to reduce inflammation and fibrosis in the kidney and in the cardiovascular system, and thereby, at least in part, reduce cardiorenal risk. And then finally, of course, metabolic abnormalities, which can be targeted with therapies like GLP-1 receptor agonists and other antihyperglycemic therapies um, are associated with a reduction in, in renal risk. And we, we know that although improving glycemic control, for example, does not necessarily reduce cardiovascular risk in people with type 2 diabetes or reduce mortality, there is an effect on the kidney and on reducing CKD progression by improving glycemic control. So I've put these as sort of Venn diagrams on this slide because uh, uh, the, these areas absolutely overlap significantly, but I wanted to give a sense of where, we, where these therapies likely target primarily, uh, but also do recognize that there is, of course, overlap between these different areas. So in thinking about layers of protection and reducing CKD risk, we will likely have to target multiple factors and multiple pathways to reduce CKD progression using combinations of these factors and therapies in our patients. So starting out with the SGLT2 inhibitors, and I, and I don't want to spend a long time on this because I, I think that, um, that, uh, that many of you will be familiar with many of these uh, areas and many of these mechanisms, um, but I think it's important to recognize that there are many different pathways that have been linked with the protective effect of the SGLT2 inhibitors that I'll talk about in a moment in the kidney. Um, and I'll just focus on a few of these. So at the, at the one o'clock position is this reduction in glomerular pressure and intraglomerular hypertension that's been closely linked with the SGLT2 inhibitors. And this is likely primarily through a, an effect on constricting the inflow afferent arterial in the kidney and in doing so, reducing renal blood flow and reducing glomerular hypertension. Now, there, there may be other mechanisms that are linked with the reduction in glomerular pressure, but the afferent constriction has been shown at least directly in animals, and there is human data to support that as well, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, uh, the other uh, important thing to recognize about that reduction in glomerular pressure is that this is important clinically because we see an initial dip in GFR when starting SGLT2 inhibitors, and this is likely because of this reduction in glomerular pressure that uh, occurs rapidly after initiation of therapy. And we also know that it's reversible. So if you stop an SGLT2 inhibitor, then the afferent arterial will redilate, and then the GFR will go back up to where it was prior to the initiation of that therapy. So this is an acute and reversible effect, which is hemodynamic through this mechanism on the afferent arterial. The other important factors to recognize as kidney protective um, include the fact that at the, the 12 o'clock position is that there is a direct, uh, there, there is likely a direct cardiovascular effect with these therapies through volume and other mechanisms. And by reducing heart risk and cardiovascular risk, then we maintain perfusion to the kidneys, and this may also prevent CKD progression. And then uh, as uh, a couple of final thoughts below at the six and seven o'clock positions are 
reductions in inflammatory and profibrotic mechanisms in the kidney that's been shown in animals. And there's some human data to support that too. And then uh, an increase in oxygenation. So I like to think of SGLT2 inhibitors as kind of beta blockers for the kidney because SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the, the, uh, the consumption of oxygen and nutrients in renal tubular cells, for example, and thereby reduce um, energy requirements, just like a beta, beta blocker does in the kidney, thereby reducing um, um, oxygen consumption and uh, requirements, which reduces the risk of ischemia. And there is some human data that, that supports that concept as well. So please do remember reductions in glomerular pressure, cardiovascular protection, and changes in oxygenation and inflammation, which may be important for protection of the kidney and indeed for the heart as well. So we think that these <clears throat> changes in glomerular pressure are through the naturetic effects of the SGL2 inhibitors. And if you just draw your attention to the left-hand side of the slide, you can see that by blocking reabsorption, reabsorption of salt in the proximal tubule, that increases delivery of sodium more downstream. So these little blue dots representing sodium molecules are delivered to the macula densa, um, and uh, essentially by increasing delivery of sodium to the macula densa, that uh, increases sodium reabsorption by macula densa cells, which is of course an energy dependent process that breaks down ATP to its byproduct adenosine. And adenosine at this level of the kidney at the afferent arterial is linked with binding to the adenosine one receptor and the adenosine one rece receptor is vasoconstrictive. So by increasing naturesis that essentially induces a, an adenosine mediated vasoconstriction in the kidney, which reduces proteinuria and reduces glomerular hypertension. So that's the main mechanism that's likely responsible, at least in early diabetes. And so in humans, we, we, this data is now uh, eight years old. We, uh, we reported that in people with type one diabetes and with hyperfiltration, so these are patients with, uh, who were in their early twenties with, um, with, uh, with type one diabetes, no kidney disease, not on an ACE or an ARB, and high levels of GFR at baseline by inulin clearance, the GFR was 172 at baseline with levels that were even much higher than that in some patients. GFR came down in response to empagliflozin to 139, and you can see as well that renal blood flow declined and renal vascular resistance increased. So all of this pattern of a decline in GFR and blood flow with a rise in vascular resistance is very much in keeping with an afferent constrictive effect, which is, which is uh, mediated by these tubuloglomerular feedback mechanisms that I mentioned earlier. So this, uh, this, was, this is data under clamped euglycemic conditions. We showed the same thing under clamped hyperglycemic conditions in these patients. And in animals, uh, this is data from Naoki Kashihara's group uh, in Japan. And you can see that uh, this beautiful data, which is, it represents in vivo microscopy. So essentially a very powerful microscope sitting on the surface of the kidney in an alive uh, anesthetized animal. This is a glomerulus before and the same glomerulus after SGLT2 inhibitor therapy. At baseline, the afferent arterial was quite dilated. And uh, that's characteristic of early type 1 diabetes, of course. And then in response to empagliflozin, the same uh, afferent arterial constricts. And there was an associated reduction in, uh, in, in hyperfiltration and GFR, all of which suggests that there is a, a direct afferent effect, which influences uh, glomerular pressure and influences uh, renal risk when we translate these observations into humans. We also recently... Uh, performed a follow-up uh, study uh, in people with type 1 diabetes to understand the interaction between being on an ACE inhibitor and then be, being placed on an SGLT2 inhibitor on top of that. These were, again, patients with type 1 diabetes uh, and, and, uh, and no evidence of uh, chronic kidney disease. And we, we, we essentially treated patients with uh, an ACE inhibitor first, and then they were randomized to uh, ampagliflozin or placebo. And you can see that although there was no change with an ACE inhibitor, uh, in, uh, in, in, in response to uh, ramipril when the, when the SGL2 inhibitor was added on top of that, you can see that even when patients are already on a background of an ACE inhibitor, that you see this nice dip in GFR acutely at four weeks, suggesting that there is this additive hemodynamic effect that if you are on an ACE inhibitor, as in this trial, or if you're not on an ACE inhibitor, as in the previous trial, that there is a, uh, an effect on inducing a reduction in glomerular pressure. 
So how does all this translate into renal benefits in terms of these mechanisms? So, um, and I'll go through this briefly because I think this will be also be familiar with many of you, but there were a whole bunch of cardiovascular safety studies with the SGLT2 inhibitors, empiric outcome, CANVAS, Declare, Virtus, and others. And uh, when looking at all of them together, the, the two really consistent observations from these cardiovascular safety studies were one, that there was a reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. There were also reductions in MACE outcomes and other cardiovascular endpoints in some of the studies. Hospitalization for heart failure was reduced across the different trials, very consistent. And the other consistent observation was that uh, across these trials on the right-hand side, you can see that the risk of CKD progression, so significant sustained decline in GFR, end-stage kidney disease or renal death, all reduced across these trials by between 35 and 45%. So this is all in people with type 2 diabetes, all in people with varying levels of cardiovascular risk. In terms of the kidney risk in these patients, only about a third of them generally had evidence of CKD, so not a high risk, not high risk renal groups, as you'd expect, because these were cardiovascular studies, and yet we still saw this reduction in renal risk in these, in these patients. What we had to really uh, wait for was the result of the Credence trial in 2019, um, which, uh, which was performed in people with, with albuminuria uh, and with a GFR between 30 and 90 who had type 2 diabetes, so evidence of diabetic kidney disease and, and uh, high levels of albuminuria with a UACR of the equivalent of about 33 milligrams per millimole or greater. You can see that as in addition to, um, in addition to a benefit on the primary outcome, which was reduced by 30%, there were also benefits around reducing NACE risk, reducing the risk of hospitalization for heart failure, and reducing renal, renal specific endpoints. So end stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine or renal death. So the observations that have been made in secondary outcomes in the cardiovascular trials that I mentioned in the previous slide, those endpoints um, and from a renal perspective, renal risk was reduced in a, in a dedicated renal trial for the first time, which was extremely exciting and has really helped to transform um, the management of people with kidney disease and the setting of diabetes, especially in light of the trials that have come, uh, that have emerged uh, subsequently, which I'll talk about in a moment. But one of the key questions that emerged from Credence was, is there a benefit in people without diabetes? Because the benefits from these cardiovascular studies and from other, uh, other mechanistic studies all suggested that the benefit was glucose independent, that it wasn't related to A1C level at baseline, it wasn't related to the changes in A1C over time, and it didn't matter if your GFR was high or low, uh, there was still an effect that was, uh, that was beneficial, both in terms of cardiovascular and kidney benefits. And so that was, the, that was uh, one of the reasons that we uh, subsequently completed the DIAMOND trial and uh, very grateful that, uh, that Sean Barber participated and helped out with this trial um, and recruited patients along with Adira at, uh, at UBC. Um, and you can see that there was a very nice dip in GFR in patients with non-diabetic kidney disease. They didn't have hyperglycemia, they just had proteinuria and kidney disease. And you can see that there was this initial dip in GFR at six weeks with Dapica flows in very similar to the kind of dip that I've showed you in people with type 1 diabetes. We see this in people with type 2 diabetes, of course, and we even see a dip in people who don't have diabetes or kidney disease, and that's because of the naturesis that these drugs have across these different disease states and in health and disease. So this suggests a, a reduction in glomerular pressure in people with non-diabetic kidney disease, as we see in other conditions. How about in terms of outcome trials? Because the DIAMOND trial was a mechanistic study to understand this. Well, in outcome trials, uh, the DAPA-CKD trial was the first to include people with and without type 2 diabetes and include them in a dedicated renal outcome trial. And the primary outcome was a sustained 50% uh, or more decline in EGFR, end-stage renal disease, renal or cardiovascular death, which was reduced by 39%, highly statistically significant, as you can see, with the number needed to treat of only 19 so uh, the observations and the protection that was reported initially in the cardiovascular studies and then in Credence in a dedicated type 2 cohort, you can see is also replicated in a cohort that consisted of two-thirds of patients with type 2 diabetes and one-third of patients with non-diabetic kidney disease. And you can see here that uh, based on this uh, uh, outlined area 
that the effects <clears throat> were similar in people with and without type 2 diabetes at baseline. This p-value for interaction, not significant, uh, suggesting similar effects across people uh, with and without type 2 diabetes. Didn't matter if their UACR was above or below the mean or GFR above or below the uh, rough mean. There were similar, again, effects and similar benefits across those different important subgroups. And there have been many analyses that have come out since in both abstract form and in papers to show that there are is consistency across the different subgroups of patients who were included in uh, the uh, DAPA-CKD trial, including this, I think, very important analysis from DAPA-CKD that looked at patients with stage four versus stage two or three. So GFR above or below 30, and that's important because in credence, patients only with a GFR of 30 and above were included. So here you can see that there, the risks of the primary outcome and stage kidney disease, kidney or cardiovascular death, uh, all similar effects across these different uh, across these different important subgroups of patients. Uh, again, emphasizing that it, that that uh, doesn't matter if there is low GFR when you when you'd expect there to be very little glucosuria, very little effect on glucose lowering. We still see these renal benefits, which emphasizes that this is a glucose independent effect that's mediated by naturesis and the other mechanisms that I mentioned earlier. The other thing that we learned about uh, uh, from these trials was uh, around the uh, very reassuring safety profile. So uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors, as many of you know, are, are generally uh, very well tolerated. The, the main thing to think about really are genital tract infections, which are, which are uncomplicated. And then there are very rare, um, rare uh, potential adverse effects, such as diabetic ketoacidosis, which is, uh, which is extremely rare, probably less than about 0.1% of people who take them, but it's serious, so we do have to, of course, think about it. The other thing that we learned from the, these studies was around, um, was around hyperkalemia, and uh, it was not really understood for quite a while about whether there's a change in potassium, what the effect of the SGLT2 inhibitors is on potassium, and what we've learned slowly, especially in meta-analyses, such as this one that was published earlier this, this year, is that SGLT2 inhibitors tend to mitigate or reduce the risk of hyperkalemia uh, defined by a potassium of six or greater. And across these different studies, which you can see at the bottom, um, there was about a 16% reduction in the risk of hyperkalemia with a potassium of six or greater and a reduction in the risk of first hyperkalemia event by about 20%. And that's probably because when the potassium level gets very high, there's more, uh, there's, there's, uh, more uh, potassium that potentially can be excreted in the context of a natriuretic therapy, uh, such as an SGLT2 inhibitor. So it's kind of, I think of it almost like a, like the escape valve on a bathtub. When the water level rises too high, then the water kind of drains into this, into this emergency drain that's at the top of most bathtubs so that the water doesn't overflow. And similarly, uh, when the potassium gets too high, there's sort of an escape valve in the kidney through naturesis and increased, uh, increased kidney excretion although we don't really understand the mechanisms well uh, based on available data, such as with urine potassium content, and that needs to be done in the future. The other, um, the other thing we've learned about these therapies is around acute kidney injury. So uh, there was concern because of the dip in GFR with the SGL2 inhibitors that they may increase the risk of kidney injury, but we know that that dip in GFR is actually protective. Patients who have a dip in GFR on an SGLT2 tend to do the best over the long term. Um, and in addition to that, these therapies are actually linked with a significant reduction in the risk of acute kidney injury. This is an analysis from, uh, from DAPA-CKD, where you can see that the risk of acute kidney injury was reduced by 32%. And this has been replicated in a meta-analyses across the different SGLT2 inhibitor trials. Um, not knowing why this reduction in AKI uh, the risk occurs maybe because of improved oxygenation or reduced ischemia, reperfusion. We don't yet know, and that certainly uh, merits further investigation, perhaps in animal models, to better understand why this uh, occurs in response to these therapies. So we know that, uh, that there is certainly a rapid translation of these trials um, into clinical practice guidelines, and um, this is probably already outdated, although it's only a month, you know, about a month old. And there's a really an iterative process of reevaluation and changing the guidelines, which is great, uh, including the ADA guidelines. This is from KDGO, and you can see that compared to what we had in the past, which was I mentioned RAS inhibitor for patients with with uh, albuminuria, 
um, the use of uh, therapies to reduce blood pressure, glycemic, uh, and improve glycemic control, as well as statins. We see that now the, the pyramid is organized so that, you know, diet, exercise, smoking, cessation, and weight control is recommended for everybody. Then it's first-line drug therapy. So metformin, SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, RAS blockade, and statins is the next line of first-line drug therapy on top of lifestyle modification. And then we get to non-steroidal MRAs, GLP-1 receptor agonists, antiplatelet therapies. And then we have glycemic control, lipid control, and blood pressure control kind of at the top, sort of made perhaps in a more targeted way uh, to uh, both maintain safety and reduce risk in appropriate patients. So uh, interesting to see how these guidelines are evolving over time for people with diabetes and kidney disease. So I've talked about credence and DAPA CKD. There is still the EMPA kidney trial, which is which will be presented next week, which is uh, extremely exciting um, in the late breaking uh, clinical trial uh, session for those of you who are going to uh, ASN. So please do go. And uh, this is a unique trial because it included people with GFRs of down to 20 and between 20 and 45 patients could have any level of albuminuria, including normal albuminuria. So that's a unique cohort compared to the other trials that I've mentioned. And um, so you can see here that um, the EMPA kidney trial included patients with a very wide range of uh, renal risk, according to the uh, KDGO heat map compared to the previous uh, studies, which included higher risk patients with albuminuria, as I've discussed in previous slides. So you can see the differences here, uh, Credence and uh, DAPA-CKD really sort of shifted albuminuria uh, criteria over to the, uh, the right-hand side, whereas EmpiKidney much broader, including those with lower levels or normal albuminuria in the lower GFR range. And the kidney uh, had a trial design, which is shown on this slide. Just very briefly, patients were treated with empagliflozin or placebo and then followed up for the requisite number of events to occur. And as uh, many of you are aware, this trial was stopped, uh, was stopped early due to overwhelming efficacy. This is the, uh, the outcomes are include uh, cardiovascular death, kidney disease progression, um, with uh, end-stage kidney disease defined as uh, initiation of dialysis or a transplant or renal death, and the GFR outcomes defined as a 40% or more sustained decline in eGFR or a sustained eGFR of less than 10. And if you want to read more about the baseline characteristics, you can, uh, you can review this, uh, this uh, baseline characteristics and design paper from NDT from earlier this year that, um, that was published by the steering committee and uh, it details some of the important factors included in the trial. So more than 6,600 patients, GFR 37 and a half at baseline. <clears throat> and importantly, only a third of patients had diabetic uh, kidney disease at baseline. That's flipped from DAPA CKD, where two thirds of patients had uh, di diabetic kidney disease at baseline. So much higher proportion of patients with other etiologies of CKD. So. Um, this will be important to, uh, to, uh, to review and, uh, and to then put in the context of what we already know about these therapies in terms of their renal protective effects. So our work is still not done. We, we know that there uh, are these benefits with SGLT2 inhibitors, but yet patients still have a lot of residual risk. So in looking at the, uh, at the Credence and DAPA CKD trials, uh, you can see this residual risk in patients who are treated with an SGLT2 inhibitor is shown in the gray shaded areas in both of these trials. So the goal now really is to try to find additional therapies to further uh, reduce and push down that Kaplan-Meier curve so that residual the residual risk area is significantly decreased. So going back to our, our map, we'll talk about therapies now that target primarily inflammation and fibrosis and I'll tell you about the non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, phenarinone. So it's been sort of a long-standing aim to better understand the effect of uh, aldosterone uh, uh, antagonism in people with diabetes and kidney disease because aldosterone is associated with endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, fibrosis, oxidative stress, <clears throat> and a variety of, of uh, mechanisms that are linked not only with heart failure, progression and cardiovascular disease progression, but also with kidney disease progression. But of course, the limitation of blocking the, the MRA has been hyperkalemia, because uh, especially in people with kidney disease, hyperkalemia becomes a big issue. In people with diabetes, it's an even bigger issue. And uh, by blocking um, the MR in, in patients who are already on an ACE or ARB, 
this has been a problem with older uh, blockers such as spironolactone or aplerinone. Uh, the the, the uh, importance of uh, finerenone is that it's a, uh, a novel um, uh, non-steroidal MRA with different pharmacological properties, better selectivity, more specificity, and uh, different uh, pharmacological properties that are that have been associated with a lower hyperkalemia risk in the earlier studies in this area, including the ARCS-DN trial from around 2013, which showed only about a 2% risk of hyperkalemia requiring stopping drug. So that's lower than, in, than historical rates of hyperkalemia. And so this is really very promising as, uh, as a therapy to potentially have the benefits of blocking the mineralocorticoid receptor while at the same time having a good safety profile. So this is the design of the, um, of the uh, Fidelity trials, which consisted of two trials called Fidelio and Figaro. We don't have time to go through both the individual trials, but these two trials, Fidelio and Figaro, had similar designs with randomization to finerenone or placebo. And the Fidelity analysis essentially was a pre-planned pooled analysis in these in this in these large cohorts involving 13,000 patients and patient in patients with diabetic kidney disease to evaluate the efficacy and safety of finerenone across a patient with a profiles with a range of uh, of chronic kidney disease due to type two diabetes to examine composite cardiovascular and kidney endpoints. So you can see the important in inclusion criteria here. So patients have to be on a maximum tolerated dose of an ACE or ARB, have type 2 diabetes, and they have to have a serum potassium of, uh, of 4.8 or less at screening because of this concern, of course, about uh, developing hyperkalemia during the trial. And you can see some of the important exclusion criteria on the right, including patients with uh, HEFREF. So in combining these two trials together, you can see on the far right-hand side that uh, they had slightly different inclusion uh, criteria around albuminuria uh, categories, but you can see when, when combined, it's really quite a broad range of patients, GFRs uh, in, into the preserved uh, range, uh, GFRs of around uh, 90 for an upper range, down to 25, and you can see that there was a wide range of albuminuria in the A2 and A3 uh, categories. So a very broad range of patients who we would see in a renal practice. Um, the cardiovascular endpoint uh, was uh, significantly reduced by 14% with finerenone. Um, I'm not going to go through that data in a great deal of detail, just focus on the kidney data. So cardiovascular risk reduction and also a kidney risk reduction in patients already on an ACE or an ARB. And you can see that the renal risk, so time to kidney failure sustained 57% or more decline in EGFR, renal death reduced by 23% uh, with finerenone. And you can see as well that uh, not only was the composite reduced, there were reductions in, in components of the composite, including kidney failure, end-stage kidney disease, sustained GFR less than 15, or doubling of creatinine, or sustained 57% decline in GFR. So really uh, important uh, effects on top of an ACE or ARB with uh, meaningful clinical uh, endpoints that were, uh, that were uh, reduced in favor of finerenone. How about uh, safety? So <clears throat> there's a small blood pressure lowering effect uh, of around 3.7 millimeters of mercury at four months. Um, there was no imbalance around sexual related side effects, such as breast hyperplasia or gynecomastia. This is important as a, as a distinction from the older MRAs, which, which uh, can have a risk of, of uh, sexual related side effects. And in terms of the risk of hyperkalemia, you can see that there was an increased risk of any hyperkalemia, 14% versus 7%. Uh, with finerenone uh, having a higher risk of hyperkalemia. That, that's any hyperkalemia. What we really care about is hyperkalemia leading to permanent discontinuation. So we couldn't manage it with various therapeutic strategies, 1.7% versus 0.6%. So it's higher with finerenone, but overall relatively low risk of hyperkalemia leading to discontinuation. The other important uh, thing to think about is that in Fidelio, in the uh, subgroup of patients, about six to seven percent of patients who were on an SGLT2 inhibitor at baseline, I, I mentioned earlier that SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the risk of hyperkalemia. You can see that this was uh, reproduced in the uh, in the Fidelio trial with a significant 55 percent reduction in the risk of hyperkalemia in patients who were on a background of an SGLT2 inhibitor. So there does appear to be this very nice interaction in terms of safety for reducing. Uh, the risk of hyperkalemia. And this is an argument, of course, in favor of combining these therapies, not to, just to have better clinical effects, but also to have 
potentially a reduction in the risk of concern about hyperkalemia. Uh, there is uh, not much data around combining these therapies. Uh, uh, so in the fidelity analysis, there were similar benefits across people with and without uh, background SGL2 inhibitor use, uh, but there were very low numbers. I mentioned only about six to seven percent of patients were on an SGL2 inhibitor at baseline. So we don't have a lot of data un to understand the combinatory effects of these therapies. There are smaller mechanistic studies, such as this one by Keto Hirsping's group, which showed that there is an added effect on reducing albuminuria in patients treated with uh, dabagliflozin and aplerinone, which you can see in the middle of the slide, 53% reduction in UACR versus either therapy alone. And you can see that just like I mentioned in the previous slide, there appears to be a mitigation of the risk of uh, hyperkalemia. So the change in baseline serum, serum potassium was less with a combination of dapagliflozin and aplerinone versus aplerinone alone suggesting and reinforcing this message that there is a, uh, an, a there, there is a benefit for mitigating hyperkalemia risk when combining uh, a, a, an SGLT2 inhibitor with an MRA. There is also the CONFIDENCE trial, which is ongoing uh, and uh, is examining the effect of finerenone plus empagliflozin versus finerenone or empagliflozin alone. And the primary outcome is albuminuria uh, change from baseline at 180 days. Uh, and uh, this will both look at changes in albuminuria, but will also look at changes in, uh, in, in potassium levels to better, to give us more insight into both uh, potential benefits on surrogate outcomes, so albuminuria, and also around the changes in potassium with combined therapy. Um, so this is also translating into, into the clinical practice guidelines quite quickly. And again, this is evolving rapidly. I just want to draw your attention to the American Diabetes uh, Association, KDGO, um, combined recommendation around uh, the use of finerenone. So 11.3c 11, 11, 11 uh, uh, states that in patients with CKD who are at high risk of cardiovascular events or CKD progression or unable to tolerate an SGLT2, that uh, non steroidal MRA is recommended to reduce CKD progression and cardiovascular events. So this data is both interesting and also rapidly, uh, rapidly um, uh, having an impact on our guidelines. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to implement this in our patients uh, very soon. So as a, a final uh, area, um, I wanted to mention the GLP-1 receptor agonists and dual agonists, because I think this is where we're gonna be going uh, in the near future as sort of uh, adding a pillar to our, our treatment approach to patients with uh, type 2 diabetes and kidney disease. Um, these therapies, of course, are used to reduce uh, metabolic risk and also have had have been shown to reduce a cardiovascular risk in the case of the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And uh, just like the SGLT2 inhibitors, however, the GLP-1 receptor agonists have a variety of direct and indirect effects, which may benefit the kidney. The indirect effects include improving glycemic control, uh, reduction in blood pressure and weight loss. And they also have effects in the kidney, including naturesis, potentially hemodynamic effects, although that's not well understood. And they also have effects on blocking the RAS, oxidative stress, and inflammatory related pathways. So lots of potential mechanisms for renal benefit. And we know that in post hoc pooled analyses of uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist studies, including LEADER and SUSTAIN-6, which used uh, loraglutide and, and semaglutide respectively, that if you look at the middle row of this uh, table, that in patients with GFRs between 30 and 60 with micro or macro albuminuria, um, as stated in this, uh, in this analysis and review, that there was a, a reduction in the risk of declining kidney um, uh, function either defined as 30 or 40 or 50 or 57%, didn't matter how it was defined, there was a significant reduction in the risk of declining kidney function in these higher risk patients. And similarly, in the Rewind trial uh, by Herzl Gerstein published in uh, 2019, you can again see at the bottom of this, uh, of this table that there was a reduction in the risk of a sustained 40% uh, decrease in EGFR uh, and the composite that included this 40% definition reduced by, uh, by 24% and sustained decline in GFR at 50% also um, uh, was statistically significant in favor of dulaglutide in this trial, 
in patients um, with established cardiovascular disease or at high cardiovascular risk. So across three different trials, looking at renal-related uh, endpoints, there does seem to be a benefit in reducing renal uh, risk in a clinically meaningful way. Uh, and this uh, concept is being studied prospectively in a dedicated renal trial called FLOW, which uh, is testing the effect of semaglutide versus placebo on the composite of declining kidney function, um, end-stage kidney disease, renal or cardiovascular death. This trial is ongoing and uh, hopefully we'll have, uh, we'll have uh, results in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the coming future. Then the final uh, area that I wanted to discuss are dual, uh, dual agonists. Um, and I'll just review some trisepatide data because we presented this at the American Diabetes Association meeting and this, this analysis was just published in Lancet Diabetes. So it's a, it's a really interesting and provocative area because of the, um, the, the very promising effects that were seen in this analysis from the SURPASS-4 trial in patients with type 2 diabetes. And this is now a comparison of trisepatide versus insulin. So this isn't compared to a placebo, it's compared to another glucose lowering therapy. And I think that's in part what makes this so uh, interesting. So trisepatide is a once weekly um, GIP, GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is, is approved in uh, outside of Canada, for example, in the US. And it's uh, been shown to improve glycemic control more than insulin in patients on oral uh, diabetes treatments in patients with type 2 diabetes and high cardiovascular risk. And of course, people with type 2 diabetes at high cardiovascular risk are also at risk for losing kidney function. So the aim of this analysis from the uh, SURPASS-4 trial was to examine the effect of trisepatide versus insulin on, a, a, al on albuminuria, on GFR decline, and on composite kidney endpoints. This is the design of the trial. So patients were uh, treated with either trisepatide, uh, one of three doses versus insulin. Uh, patients, uh, this is a pre-specified exploratory analysis. Patients had to have type two diabetes, UACR, uh, sorry, uh, a hemoglobin A1C of between seven and a half to 10 and a half, and uh, had to be at high cardiovascular risk and use uh, between one and three oral antihyperglycemic medications, uh, which you can see on the slide. The patients were followed up um, uh, over time, over 104 weeks. So you can see these uh, effects on A1C are, are, are pretty uh, dramatic uh, with reductions from, uh, from 8.5 at baseline down to 6.1 with higher dose trisepatide versus a reduction to only 7.5 with insulin. So a marked uh, improvement in A1C even compared to insulin. And you can see these very dramatic degrees of weight loss. So 11.1 kilograms with high dose trisepatide um, uh, and demonstrating the, the potent metabolic effects of these, uh, of these therapies. In terms of baseline characteristics, and this is important from the renal perspective, you can see that GFR was quite preserved at baseline. So 81 to 82 mils per minute of GFR, uh, only uh, about 18% uh, of patients had GFRs of less than 60. And uh, this was not a CKD high risk cohort. So most patients had uh, normal albuminuria and about a third of patients had uh, UACRs of, uh, of 3.4 milligrams per millimole and above. So relatively low risk group of patients. So this is the effect of uh, trisepatide on, uh, on uh, UACR change. And I think what's, what's important is, you, and this is compared to insulin, uh, just as a reminder, not compared to placebo, you can see that there was in the overall cohort a 31%, 32% reduction in UACR in patients with, uh, with higher levels of UACR 3.4 and above. You can see these uh, 40 to 50% reductions in, in albuminuria um, and patients at higher risk of renal outcomes. So patients at high, higher KDGO risk categories, again, you can see this preserved effect on reducing albuminuria by about 45, 46%. So big reductions in albuminuria, an important surrogate marker of, uh, of renal risk, which, uh, which we of course uh, know is associated with renal and cardiovascular risk. And we know that reducing albuminuria is also associated with benefits from a renal perspective and indeed from a cardiovascular perspective. So very, very interesting. Um, and uh, you can see that this is GFR slope with trisepatide versus insulin glargine. And again, you can see these levels of uh, preserving GFR slope compared to 
uh, compared to insulin, so preserving between 1.3 and 3.7 mils per minute per year. This is sort of in line with what we expect to see with in some of the SGLT2 inhibitor trials, so very, very important uh, degree of magnitude of, of preventing renal function loss. We know that anything, any drug that reduces renal, uh, renal function loss by more than 0.75 mils per minute per year is associated with long-term uh, benefits on composite renal outcomes. So this, these levels of preserving renal function between 1.3 and 3.7 mils per minute per year, that's certainly with, within that uh, range where, we, where there is a, a, a strong association with renal protection. In patients who were or who were not on an s at, at baseline in this trial, you can see that the reductions in albuminuria were, were very similar. And uh, similarly, for renal function loss, uh, GFR slope was preserved um, uh, regardless of uh, SGLT2 inhibitor use at baseline as well. For composite kidney outcomes, again, this is not a renal risk cohort, uh, but when we define this uh, as, uh, as the composite outcome, including progression of albuminuria, there was a significant uh, reduction in this composite outcome, so reduced by 42% in terms of the risk of uh, progression of albuminuria, GFR decline, end-stage kidney disease, or renal death. Uh, but do recognize that this was largely driven by a reduction in new onset macroalbuminuria. Interesting directional effects for reducing renal function loss did not reach statistical significance. And there were too few events for renal death or progression to ESRD to end-stage kidney disease to, uh, to know whether there are benefits on those composites. So very interesting thought-provoking and certainly uh, suggests that further studies are warranted. So I'm going to stop there because I want to leave some time for questions and discussion. Um, I hope this has been uh, useful and interesting to this group. I think there's likely overlap between the different classes of kidney protective therapies in terms of the mechanisms for how they work. Uh, the, the, the common final pathway likely involves reducing fibrosis. Um, and uh, specifically for finerenone, um, there, there is experimentally an effect on reducing fibrosis, but I think we also need to understand whether there may be additional benefits on reducing hemodynamic abnormalities. And similarly, we need to understand how the uh, dual agonists and GLP-1 receptor agonists work. And finally, we need to understand the combinatory effect of these therapies because we're not going to be using one or the other we're going to be adding these therapies on top of one another like a layer cake to have the best maximal effect while at the same time mitigating any side effects. So I'll thank many of the funders that have supported me, my collaborators, and thank you for attending. And Adira, I'll pass back to you for the question and answer. Yeah, no, great. Thank you so much, David. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a great time to be in nephrology right now to have all of these uh, amazing um, opportunities to alter the course of kidney disease. So there are a few questions. So one is about non inflammatories, uh, whether or not they would blunt the effect of an SGLT2. And so are we avoiding, should we avoid non if you're on SGLT2? Sure. So thanks for the question uh, around NSAIDs. So the, the, the um, straightforward answer, I think, is avoid NSAIDs all the time. Um, if whenever possible, because of their effects on cardiovascular and kidney risk. In terms of their interactions specifically with SGLT2 inhibitors, um, we published an analysis from Empiric Outcome in around 2017, which looked at the effect and interaction between the dip in GFR, changes in albuminuria and renal outcomes in patients who were or who, who were not on various uh, hemodynamically active medications, including RAS inhibitors, diuretics, calcium channel blockers, MRAs, and even NSAIDs. Even though there was a small number of there was a small number of patients who were taking NSAIDs in the trial, interestingly, we did not see any interaction between GFR dipping or renal outcomes in those who were or who were not taking an NSAID. So there doesn't appear to be a hemodynamic interaction, maybe because NSAID ac action is relatively short-lived for most of the NSAIDs. They tend to be you know, taken multiple times a day. So they may not have been acting at the time when the, you know, when the GFR was drawn, for example, to explain why there's no hemodynamic interaction, or it's just that the mechanisms are disparate. And in fact, when looking at the effects of SGLT2 inhibitors on prostanoid levels in the urine, there actually does not appear to be any interaction with prostanoid levels. So it may be that the SGLT2 inhibitors act in a, in a, in a, in a way, in a manner that's independent of vasoactive effects on prostanoids, specifically through adenosine, 
And so accordingly, they don't have any interaction with blocking prostanoids because if they don't, they don't have any effect on them. Great, thank you. There's also um, a question, um, again, thanking you for a great talk as we all will. Um, so are you using SGLT2s in your type one diabetics, number yeah. one? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, ask that, I'll answer that question first. So uh, so no, uh, I've only used uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in people with type 1 diabetes in the context of clinical trials, and that's what we'll, the way we'll continue to operate until more data is available. Uh, the risk in people with type 1 diabetes when they're used just for glycemic control is that there is a modest effect on improving glycemic control, but there is an increased risk of diabetic ketoacidosis in type 1 diabetes especially, probably an increase in risk of 3 or 4% roughly. So it's you know it's it's important as a risk factor and can be serious. So um, in in overall people with type one diabetes, the risk of DKA probably outweighs the risk of benefits around glycemic uh, management. Um, the question that's not yet been answered is whether there's a benefit in people with lower GFR. So GFR is for example below sixty who are at high kidney risk or high cardiovascular risk, or the benefit of the SGLT2 inhibitor may be very great and the risk around DKA may be relatively low and thereby have a favorable benefit to risk ratio. And that's, been, that's being examined in ongoing trials, but we don't have an answer about that yet because people with kidney disease were excluded from all of the type one diabetes SGLT2 inhibitor research programs. So we don't know yet. Right, and my understanding is that it's, you, they never get DKA in the absence of an inciting event. Yes, right? and like usually, it's not spontaneous yeah. DKA, yeah. it's always in the context. So, yeah, uh, it's, really, it's almost like it worsens the whole thing because you know, there are, you know lower insulin doses perhaps because of the SGLT2 inhibitor and right. then the direct effect potentially of promoting ketogenesis, but then it, it, something else triggers it, an illness or an infection or dehydration, and, and that's where the risk is. Yeah, fully agree. Right. And so there's another question about transplant recipients, and there's been a reluctance to use these agents yeah. in the setting of a denervated kidney that's already sensitive to volume depletion. They're not stopping the agents when they're started by cardio or endo in a transplant, but they've not been pushing them either, as we have in CKD. So comments on that. Yeah, great, great question. Thanks, uh, David. Um, so the, uh, th this is a, a really exciting area too. Um, and there aren't any dedicated uh, trials that are out outside of mechanistic studies that have addressed this question. There are, also, there are smaller mechanistic studies that have shown reductions in blood pressure and A1C and weight and so on, and you know, N equals 50 kind of studies, but there, there, there are no data in patients with a kidney transplant in the larger trials. It was, immunosuppression was an exclusion criteria. So we just don't know from the larger trials. Um, and so the, the question is, does the, does the benefit of these therapies outweigh the potential risk in terms of the denervated single kidney and potential inability to, uh, to uh, autoregulate um, and maintain renal perfusion, um, thereby having a good safety profile? And the answer is we don't know. So there are studies that are ongoing. We're doing one here at U of T called Infinity to try to understand the effects hemodynamically in the kidney and the cardiovascular system. And there are, are there are other efforts that are ongoing, again, in generally in several hundred patients that, are, that will get some of these questions. Uh, so we may not ever answer the question definitively. One of the ways to look at this may be through, uh, th through uh, uh, health record data to understand uh, the, the benefits and downsides in patients who are taking these therapies versus other glucose lowering therapies as, as has been done in non-transplant patients. That could be a way of, of looking at this in an exploratory kind of way. But uh, until those studies are done, we really have uh, very limited data to understand these important physiological and clinical interactions. Great. And then there are a question, which is, uh, I think we can't absolutely answer, which is about SGLT2 use in non-proteinuric diabetes and non-diabetic kidney disease. I think the former we can talk about the non-proteinuric diabetic um, conditions, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, there are data from uh, from the uh, cardiovascular outcome trials that that have looked that have looked at these interactions, uh, and the the interesting answer is that there doesn't appear to be from the cardiovascular trials that have looked at patients with you know UACR on the normal range or in the thirty to three hundred range or the greater than three hundred range in the American units, the milligram per gram units. Uh, there doesn't appear to be a big difference in terms of the benefits that are seen across those different levels of UACR. So um, uh, those are relatively lower risk renal cohorts, but statistically there doesn't appear to be a bigger interaction there uh, with relatively large numbers of patients across these in these large meta-analyses. And then in patients with non-diabetic kidney disease, 
um, and uh, and normal albuminuria that will really be answered in the end kidney trial. So we'll we'll have data about that very soon. That uh, that to try to answer that second part of the question. So we'll we'll have data soon. Great. Um, and then there's a question about: um, Is there anybody in whom um, it doesn't work, or or one, or if it doesn't lower proteinuria, is that a measure of non-adherence mm. versus? Um, versus something else. And yeah. uh, a corollary, just because we're running out of time, is uh, how we actually get this information out to GPs, which is probably not, that's, <laughs> that's a harder one, but sure. go ahead. So yeah, so for the first, for the first question around uh, if there's no change in albuminuria, um, so th that's one of my concerns about the new ADA guidelines that it suggested that you reduce albuminuria by 30%. And I worry that that what that'll trigger is if it doesn't reduce albuminuria, then then perhaps these therapies would be stopped. And that's probably not, that's not the right approach. Patients should be kept on these therapies, even if albuminuria doesn't decrease. Um, and uh, that's because there are many other uh, effects and many other um, mechanisms that are a benefit with these therapies. And in, in addition to that, there's a range of albuminuria lowering that seen. The mean reduction is about 30%, but some patients have, you know, 10% or less reduction. Some patients have a 90% reduction. Um, and so the patient should be kept on these drugs, even if the albuminuria level does not go down, uh, recognizing that there are likely still benefits and that the, the trials were not designed to target albuminuria lowering. They were just tar they were just designed to put patients on drug versus placebo and then look at endpoints. Some patients will have a reduction, some patients won't. With respect to, uh, and I don't think it's a sign of non-adherence. I, I do have patients who are yeah, definitely same. taking drug and you know, the albuminuria doesn't go down by that much. And I, I would still keep them on therapy uh, to derive the long-term benefits and, and, and preservation of GFR and the cardiovascular benefits. For um, getting this information to the GPs and to the general um, uh, uh, medical community, it's certainly a challenge. And I think this is going to have to be multi-pronged, including lots and lots and lots of CME, lots of cross-disciplinary um, uh, uh, talks and CME webinars, information in medical journals, um, and also uh, a support for general recommendations around screening for albuminuria and GFR on a regular basis. And then um, not only... Uh, not only the, sticking to the recommendations around screening, but make it clear about what to do after that, because now we have all these additional therapies that can target and reduce albuminuria. So I think it's going to be a very complicated, lengthy, and long-term investment to uh, to uh, achieve that. Great. Well, listen, we are just at the uh, at the hour. There are a few more questions. Um, let me just. I um, the combination of SGLT2s and GLP1s and finerenone. Um, um, just, just no data, no, no data. So I think that, but that's the next step. I think it's a great question. And that's the, that's the, this is the next thing we have to think about is combining these therapies together. Uh, I think that'll come along once the flow trial's done. We'll have, we'll probably have more efforts to better understand this sort of triumvirate of therapies on top of an ACER ARB. So it's actually four therapies potentially. Um, and uh, then there are issues around referral patterns, and uh, this is this is uh, this is a, also a complicated area. It depends on where you practice, and um, so how to change practice of the CKD stage one and two are treated to prevent DKD. I think the important message there is that we want to treat patients early. A lot of the patients in these trials did not have advanced CKD. They could have relatively preserved GFRs in the six in the seventies, eighties, and nineties with varying levels of albuminuria. And you know, these we want to prevent the fibrosis from happening in the first place because we can't reverse the fibrosis once it's already there. So I think early treatment is critical, and I think these educational opportunities and and mandates need to target that exact question: is early therapy, early screening, early therapy? Yeah, and I think it, it is changing, and I think it's it's a matter of the more we use them and are okay with it, the more GPs will be happy to use it earlier. And I think a lot of this will just take some time. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah, no, David, thank you, uh, as always, for an outstanding um, and very inclusive um, talk, but uh, for reestablishing our excitement uh, in what we can do for people uh, with different levels of kidney disease. And, uh, and thank you for all the work that you've done in the field to get us all the way to here. So very much a privilege to have uh, this talk. And uh, thank you again. Great to be with you. Take care, yeah. everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.